why did you write this? <laughs> you know, I wanted to shed some critical light on what I see as a text hypocrisy. You know, we go about saying that we're building these amazing things and doing great things for the world, but we're also causing a lot of serious problems. So I wanted to approach that in a funny, approachable way that could that the people here would actually read. Now, this is a satire, not to be confused with a tell-all. That said, you had a perch inside, you know, one of the biggest tech companies in the world. You decided to put your name on this, though you thought about writing it anonymously. Yeah. I mean, how did you weigh the risks and the benefits? I mean, I would have loved to have done it anonymously. If you work in PR your whole life, you're usually behind the scenes. The idea of doing this right now is kind of terrifying. Um, but at the end of the day, first, and I also didn't want anyone to think it was about a specific company. Um, but I also realized at this time there are few senior people in tech that speak out on issues like this, a lot of times because they move to new companies or they're still on the payroll. So I thought it was important to put my name to it. Now. As the New York Times says, not long ago, your job was to defend Silicon Valley. And when you, when you look at the plot lines, the sales guys battling with the engineers, the female employees, the unwitting subjects of a wild social experiment, the VPs plotting against each other, and the yoga-loving, sex-obsessed CEO rumored to be planning a moon colony, you know, I know the Google co-founders love their Lululemon, but is this fiction or is this fictionalized? <laughs> um, I mean, it's inspired by Google as much as it is by the startups. I, I mean, I worked in a startup too, and also the other large companies. I mean, I feel pretty confident in saying that Larry Page is not a nymphomaniac CEO obsessed with the moon. So, you know, talk to me about some of the themes here because you're fairly prescient. I mean, there's sort of like a Me Too theme. You've got the misogynistic CEO, and you've got the woman who buys into the company entirely, what, how should we interpret that, given the, the diversity problems in right. Silicon Valley today? I mean, I, um, yeah, I thought a lot about that. I went and eliminated pretty much any women or people of color, for that matter, from this book because I wanted to make a point, right, that, that we are dramatically underrepresented. And even when we are there, we often aren't given the same opportunities. And so the f one female character in the book um, is a female receptionist with a PhD uh, who basically saves the whole company with her invention. But by the end of the book, and I'm not giving much away here, she's back to being a receptionist. I can't have you here without asking you about some of the challenges that Google is facing now. Number one, trying to get back into China. The public, many people don't seem happy with this. Some employees don't seem happy with this. The US government doesn't seem happy with this. Is it the right call? You know, I'm really torn on the China issue. On the one hand, I believe in moral imperatives. I think what Google did was really admirable. I felt really proud at the time. On the other hand, I think it's a fair question to ask, what tangible good did it do other than making us feel really good? In that censorship is worse in China, information access is worse in China. There is an argument to be made that more search competition, whether it's by Google or someone else, could actually, and potentially a company that might do less censorship, could actually be a really good thing for Chinese users. So I'm willing to give them the benefit of the doubt of seeing actually what they want to do and how they would plan to build in safeguards for Chinese users. I mean, I think, I think the devil's really in the details. Google did not take an opportunity to testify before Congress. Now they are uh, sending Sundar Pichai. If you were working at Google, you would have been part of that decision. Was that a mistake? I mean, I wasn't there, so I don't know what the thought process was. Uh, but I think you've kind of answered the question in the sense that they didn't go, and now they have to go anyway. So, you know. So when you say at times you felt you had to defend the indefensible, what do you think is indefensible. Well, I think across the industry there's just a real problem that we have of uh, kind of black and white thinking that we lead so much with data all the time which I think lends itself to a certain level of moral abstractionism that you say oh well you know with two billion users maybe a small percentage of that is bad actors and and when you look at that just like that this tiny tiny percentage it's very easy to forget that that's actually thousands or millions, right? And that's electoral interference, that's live stream suicides, that's M Myanmar. I mean, it's, it's really horrific stuff. But again, it gets abstracted to this data point where then it looks so small that you don't actually look at that in a really human way and think, how can we solve this the best way, not just how do we solve this with machines? We're entering an era where tech is really unpopular. And you're right, it's not just Google. It's you know Facebook just announcing 50 million accounts were hacked, not knowing the extent of it. Oh, and all of these companies that are tied into the Facebook login could also be affected as well. Do you think that this is the beginning of a prolonged era of tech hating? And if you were on the inside of Google, how would you be handling it? I think in terms of the, the question around what the, the cycle that we're in, absolutely. You know, I don't think the Valley has enough interaction with the outside world. The 
they, instead they build what they want and impose it on the outside world. And the outside world is increasingly getting angry about that power dynamic. Um, so I think that I think it, it's going to come to a head in some way. Um, if I were at Google or any of the large companies, um, I would really want to have a heart to heart and some sort of level of self interrogation around are we always approaching, first of all, are we always asking ourselves at the very start, what the potential unintended consequence of this. Like if you build a platform for free speech, you're building a platform for free speech. Anyone can say anything, right? It's not just all roses and wonderful things. And, and so what, what does that mean? And second, I think the other thing I would do is, is say, are, you know, the starting point in so many of these companies, whenever a problem arises, is let's solve it with machines. Or you tell everyone, we're gonna solve it with AI. Well, the truth is AI may solve these problems one day, but it doesn't do a great job today. And so just throwing your hands up in front of regulators and saying, well, you know, the machines will get there at some point, it's a pretty unsatisfactory answer. Why medium and what does that say about the traditional publishing industry? I mean, I thought it was pretty appropriate that a book about tech would be on a tech platform. I loved that it was free. It's a free Free book for anyone. You can use it on your. You can read it on your e-reader. I loved that it was globally accessible immediately, and there was none of the traditional publishing turnaround times, um, which just made it a pretty exciting opportunity.